Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the uh, Frontiers in Quantitative Finance Seminar. My name is Rama Khan from Oxford, and I'm pleased to welcome you on, on behalf of the Oxford Mathematical and Computational Finance Group, which brings this seminar to you in collaboration with our sponsors, the City Group and Mosaic Smart Data. So we're very pleased to host this seminar this term in the, in the, in the City Group Auditorium here. Uh, it'll be here for the next uh, two or three seminars, at least until January. Um, uh, so uh, today we're very pleased to have as our uh, speaker Jesper Andreasen. Jesper is a well-known figure in the in the quant the community. He has been around for a while. He has uh, held many uh, uh, many quantum research positions as head of quantitative research in various banks, Saxo Bank, Danske Bank. Uh, I'm not going to name all of them. You can find it on the website in his bio. Uh, and he has also made a lot of contributions to the quantitative finance research literature. He wrote uh, a lot of different uh, articles on various aspects of option pricing, computational methods in finance, volatility modeling. And uh, in the last few years, like many other quants, he has uh, uh, he, he's dived into uh, applications of machine learning irresistible topic. And uh, today he will share some of his thoughts about his re recent work on decoding the autoencoder. Thank you, Jesper. Over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'll just kick off and um, hope you guys can hear me. Um, okay. All right. So title of the talk is um, decoding the autoencoder. So here's a bit of an outline. Um, First, a little bit about neural networks and autoencoders in general, and then how, how you can apply them to yield curves and comparison to some empirical results, which basically just confirms what other people have found previously. Um, but then I actually introduce something else. I start looking at um, absence of arbitrage in these neural networks and, and how we, you know, um, how you can, you know, whether there is absence of arbitrage or not. And, and how you can, you know, potentially, if there isn't arbitrage, how you can extract risk-neutral dynamics from the autoencoder. So basically, you can actually, if you have the autoencoder given, you can actually extract what model lies behind this. <clears throat> okay, so if you have the autoencoder and the autoencoder at the same time is arbitrage-free, then you can actually extract. Um, you can actually extract what the um, a diffusion process which uh, for the short rate which supports this um uh you know uh this autoencoder so basically extracting the dynamics from the autoencoder then i'm going to discuss how that rhymes with uh, so that's the internal part arbitrage basically but there's a second bit to that is whether the auto whether the dynamics of the um of the auto implied dynamics of the autoencoder actually match those that are realized and then we're going to discuss some um, extensions and modifications and other uh, applications, and then round off with a conclusion. Okay. All right. So references here. There's a paper. Um, I wrote a paper on it, so or article on it, which is called uh, "Decoding the Autoencoder Encoder" in Wilmot. It just came out in September. Um, <clears throat> then there's some more uh, empirical studies of autoencoders in the context of yield curves. Kondratiev and Sokol, 18 and 22. And then there's one with also encoders in the context of implied volatility uh, movements by Hull and Kao and Chen. There's also actually this, you know, I've forgotten it and should be on the slides. There's actually, there's actually a link between, there's actually a strict link between uh, some of this literature and earlier literature by from the 90s about uh, late 90s about arbitrage consistency of functional forms of yokos. So, for example, paper by Björk and Christensen, where they investigate whether whether or not, <clears throat> say, Nielsen Siegel is actually supported by an arbitrage-free model or not. So, so this is sort of um, this is sort of the um, yeah uh, the references and the context. Okay, so neural networks. Okay, so. You can write a lot of uh, little ants about what a neural network is, and here's you know uh, so it, it, you know here's a definition, and it's really like sort of a um, a chain of uh, linear functions 
which are interrupted by linear transforms, which are interrupted by nonlinear activation function, which then generates the next vector of, um, of, um, of, uh, of states. And so you start with an input vector of x, uh, x0, it says, and um, then you end with an xm, which is the output through layers of, um, of, um, <coughs> of linear transformations combined with nonlinear activation like that. Normally, a better way to sort of actually conceptually understand what's going on is to do a drawing of it. So typical way of illustrating a new network is that you have you know, some input layers here, some Xs, there's five of them. In this case, the dimension of the X in this case is five. Then you have these three hidden layers and then you end up, okay, then you have three hidden layers, layers of a dimension of eight, and then you end with a hidden layer of dimension three before you end with the actual output, which in this case is only one variable. So in my notation, or when I speak about neural networks, I'll use the dimension of a neural network you see here, I'll call that five, eight, eight, three, one, okay? The activation function that we're using, uh, the activation functions, a tip that you see in a neural network, uh, literature can sort of be classified into two different types. There's the sort of soft plush-ish, which are sort of option-ish, uh, you know, kinks, sort of hockey sticks. And then the soft step, which is the differential of that, which is, um, which is sort of digital-ish, sort of like an activation function of that sort. So this is sort of a neural network. What is an autoencoder then? Okay, so uh, an autoencoder is a neural network that goes narrow in the middle, uh, somewhere in the middle. It doesn't have to be symmetric as it is in this particular case, but the idea is that basically you try and say, can you narrow down, can you uh, represent the data that comes in uh, in, a, in, a, in a lower dimension than what you actually, uh, you know, comes in at. So it's sort of like a, in some sense, like a nonlinear PCA, basically. Okay, so the first part of it here is input here. And then you have output here, and it all passes through a, a network here, which we call an, a, an encoder, and this is called a decoder. In this case, we're basically saying that the input here, which has dimension three, can be represented by only dimension one, uh, and then reproduce like this. In this particular case, you do a typical autoencoder application. You would try and you know, minimize the distance between this guy and the input here, and the output there and choose the neural network weights in the neural network in such a way that you minimize that. So first part, uh, encoder, second part, decoder, and this is sort of dimension of the neural network in some sense. Okay. Um, and, you know, when you want to produce an, a neural network, uh, an autoencoder neural network, what you do is essentially to try and minimize the distance between the input and the output. And so when we're successful in that, we can say that the input, say the information of the input can be encoded in a variable with dimension that corresponds to the most narrow slice of the neural network. So in this particular case, it was three into one. What we're gonna look at later is gonna be something like eight into two or three state variables. Okay. So autoencoding yield curves. Well, okay, so the question here is how many factors are needed to accurately describe the yield curves that we observe empirically. So we will try and attempt, you know, we will attempt to answer this question using autoencoder neural networks. And the data we're going to use is um, swap rates of tenors one year, two year, three year, five year, eight, eight of them all the way up to 30 years, and uh, observed for currencies, uh, these 10 currencies or something like that. Uh, observed monthly from 2010 to 2022, so in a total of about uh, 13 years. Not all currencies present for, uh, are present for all observation dates, but <clears throat> we have approximately 1,500 yield curves in this, uh, in this uh, data set here. So the question is now, you know, can we, when we apply the autoencoder, what do we get? Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> Sorry, you yeah. pull the data together yeah. across currencies? Yeah. Actually, I do. It's a bit naughty, but I do it anyways. So basically, I say um, for all of these, um, actually, so you know, it's, it's actually the same exercise that so-called and contrative have been doing. 
basically saying, uh, is there a unique way or is there the same way of, is there one function that describes all your curves? And it turns out to be, with a good approximation, that turns out to be the case. Um, at least for the data set that they look at and the data set I look at. So the dimension of the neural network that we're looking at here is, is eight. The one I'm using is an eight, eight, two, eight, eight. And another one is eight, eight, three, eight, eight. Now you soft step activation function. Uh, the inputs are vectors of swap rates, S, and the output are zero coupon rates, actually. So I actually use the neural network, not directly to swap rate, but actually I, can, I turn them into zero coupon rates. And then I use this formula here. I spline the, the spline the zero coupon rates and I compute swap rates using, you know, uh, this formula here for, for the swap rate. So then my, so in this exercise here, my target is gonna be the L2 norm between these guys here and these guys here, okay? Over my full data set of 1500 uh, different, uh, equally weighted actually, 1500 different yield curves. So we're weighting all yield curves the same and we're assuming that the same neural network can be used for all currencies. Um, so the difference between, you know, the difference basically what we're saying is that the difference between currency Different currency yield curves is only the position of the encoding variable X. Yeah? It's nothing else than that. That's basically enough information. So the model is the same throughout the whole thing. But the only thing that distinguishes Swedish kroner and dollars or yen is that they have a different position in this X space, the middle of the autoencoder. Okay. So for reasons uh, will become clear in a moment, <clears throat> I actually use sale coupons. Uh, as the output and then reconstruct the, uh, the, the, you know, the um, swap rates from the zero coupon rates. And uh, <clears throat> we'll see in a moment why I do that. But anyways, first we just see the, the raw results. Um, so with two factor auto encoder, I, meaning there's a two dimensional, only two dimensional in the middle, so the auto encoder, if you get a fit with an RMS across the whole data set, so root mean square error, of approximately 0.1%, uh, 10 basis points across uh, the 1,500 different yield curves that we're seeing. With three factors, we give uh, slightly, get a slightly better fit with an RMS score of approximately five basis points across the full data set. So in the following, we show examples of the fit in different, oh, oops, in different scenarios, in, in different yield curve scenarios, just to see you know, what, what are we actually doing here. Let's say that overall our empirical results are roughly the same as what Kondrachev and Sokol get in their papers. Namely, this sort of five, five basis points with three factors, 10 basis points with uh, two factors. Do you put any regularization, for example, for the Gelsen prior? No. No. So there's no, um, there's no, um, that's, so the so you know it's it's common to do that actually in the variational autoencoder literature that they put a Gaussian uh, prior in the middle in order to make the um, distribution of the variables uh, sort of normalish okay with the intent that the intent that you can actually generate from that uh, you know um, from the for that distribution you can then generate you know uh, yield curves yeah okay in a in a sort of non Hmm, non-process kind of way in a sort of as if they're independent in some ways okay so are the errors you quote are the absolute errors yeah rates yeah great errors so absolute errors so basically difference between this this point and this point and then you know the average of that in an l2 sense across the, the whole way so they're <coughs> comparable to spread right? yeah spreads yeah and if you do it we see yeah as an how big is the error Significantly higher. I can't. I can't tell you exactly, but significantly higher. And I know <clears throat> actually I, you, one of the other things you can see is that when you do this, you can actually see that if you instead of doing this neural network, we actually do an, one that doesn't have two layers here and two layers there. You can actually see substantial difference in that. So there is there is the nonlinearity does capture something. On the other hand, it doesn't. It's not like if you <clears throat> put more stuff on put more layers on the other way that, that necessarily gives you more. It's, it's not as if that, if you put a lot of stuff this way either, doesn't really give you anything either. Sort of, this sort of first shot and it turns out to be not too bad, not too shabby. Um, okay. So <clears throat> these are just like, 
I'm going to use the same color coding throughout the whole uh, talk here. So this is one yield curve, right? I don't even know what it is, but it's one of them. And this sort of normal one, here's another one. That's an inverted one. And here's another one with a lower level normal, here's a very low interest rate scenario you have here. So that is the same. So the colors would refer to the same thing. In this case, the um, <clears throat> I think the the ones with the dots on are the actual input, and the ones with the without the dots are the output. Okay. So here you measure the error and the difference between levels. Right. Yeah. yeah. Whereas when you do PCA, you could do it on levels or typically changes. do typically do it in terms of covariance matrices, right? I mean, yeah, covariance of changes and changes, errors, yeah, or levels. So changes are changes typically. Huh? You can be very close, but the changes can be quite different. Yeah, 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 yeah. Indeed. So did, did you look at changes? I did not look at changes for this. This is just in and out, the same thing. You know, so and I didn't spend a lot of time actually comparing to PCA. You know, because I always get this question, you know, the two times I presented this before, did you compare to PCA? Not thoroughly and not enough. Um, so I don't have the results here. Okay, so this was the two factor, the three factor. You get a slightly tighter fit, and you can probably see that here. You, know, you can sort of just skim that, you know, see that it gets a little bit better there. Okay. And now, so um, <clears throat> that's pretty impressive, actually. You know, I would say yes. I mean, obviously, the f from the fact that you know, from the fact that you put in an extra uh, variable, you get a slightly bigger, uh, you know, neural network, and from that, you obviously get more degrees of freedom, and your fit, fit and your statistical error and your statistical properties are certainly not better for this one. There is that they are from the other. So whether this is, oh, this is also, you know, sometimes I'm not doing, <clears throat> I don't have enough in this particular case. I actually don't really have enough uh, data to do a proper analysis where I look at in-sample and out-of-sample and all this sort of stuff. This is all in-sample, right? So this, you know, I am cheating a bit, okay? I, you know, I confess, you know, you know, I took the polygraph and all that. Okay, but anyways, uh, I didn't have, you know, an, as much data on this as I would like to. Uh, we can discuss this at the end of the talk a bit more about, you know, uh, directions I would like to take on this, uh, including, you know, using more data. And also, I mean, I would say that the sample period, which is, uh, is, is, is 10 to 22, is a bit not good. Yeah, it's actually been more interesting if you go all the way back in the 80s and the 90s and see if, you know, if you can get more out of that. So the you know the ability the ability to actually see different yield curves comes from basically looking at different uh, currencies in some sense. Okay, which might also bias results a little bit. Anyways, um, okay, um, and here we go. Absence of arbitrage. So this is a question. Whenever you have a functional form or something. You can ask the question whether you actually have absence of arbitrage or you don't in, this, in, in, in a following sense, which I'm gonna describe in a second. So, so we have the empirical result that all discount factors can be written as in a neural network of some, the decoder part basically of some X where X is some like abstract state variable, which we have not you know, identified it other than it's just abstract. But if you know at the same time that these bond prices uh, are arbitrage free in the sense that there is a short rate process that wiggles along and produces these in the risk neutral space and produces these bond prices, then, you know, then we say, okay, so we basically, you know, we have, we have this statement up here, but you have another statement down here saying that the, if they are arbitrage free, then this has to be the case. So if you put the two things together, what do we get? But we get that <laughs> this expectation here. On one hand, we have this guy here, but this must be the same as the expectation only conditional to x because we know that that x that x is what the neural network produces here. In other words, 
if this is the case for all t comma x and all tors and all this sort of stuff, we can conclude that the short rate itself can only be a function of the state vector x. Okay, so it can only be, a, and, and x itself must be a Markov process under the risk neutral measure. Okay, so this is sort of like two strong results. So if you further assume that rates evolve continuously, that the short rate evolve continuously, then it has to be the case that they exist r comma mu comma sigma so that functions of x. Okay, so one thing, okay, so one thing, other thing is to say that it's not only a Markov process, it's also a stationary process. It's uh, uh, time, in the, uh, time homogeneous. I mean, that's what I meant. Process. So that, you know, um, R is a function of this X variable only, and X evolves according to stochastic differential equation that looks like this. <clears throat> no, not in this case, right? Because it can't be a function of time in this particular case, because here you actually have uh, stationarity, right? Oh, sorry, uh, you have um, homo time homogeneity, right? The the neural network only depends on time to maturity, right? And you know, and x. So there's no there, there's no time dependence in this. So you have uh, you know time homogeneous uh, functions in this case. So so then you know basically um, from from this and from the fact that you know the uh, risk neutral expected return of the fund, funded bond position is zero, then it turns out that this is uh, equivalent to saying that the neural network bond prices have to satisfy this PDE. Okay, And this is the normal PDE, except for one thing here. That you can see that I, instead of writing dt here, I've actually writ written d tall minus d tall. And I can do that because it's time homogeneous. All right, okay. Uh, and this has to hold for all uh, x comma tall. So now I, you know, I basically what I essentially I can do is that I could pluck my neural network into this for different maturities, and then do a best fit of r and mu and sigma, so that you know uh, the fits the you know for each x I, I basically you know, produce a function, uh, so that for each x I basically produce a, <laughs> a triple of r mu sigma. That you know uh, that supports this. Um, if no such solution exists, then it's possible to form a portfolio of n plus one bonds with zero volatility that has a return that's different from the risk-free rate. So, if there's no solution, so there's no triple pair here of r mu comma sigma comma x uh, of r mu comma sigma, then you know th there's an upcharge built into the system, and there's no supporting uh, process, uh, you know, which holds, uh, you know, that works for this. So, sorry, hmm? the dimension of this? Dimension. Two. Two or three. Why two? Because it's a Markov process, right? That's enough to, uh, to do, I mean, basically back to this one. You know your X vector, right? In my case, in my case, I know my X, X vector is either two or three, or size two or three. So because of that, you know, it has to be a Markov process and it's enough to, it's sufficient to drive it with only two bound motion in this case, two or three emotions. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if there is no internal upcharge, you can say that the excess return of every, any bond on the P, not on the Q, any bond on the P is given as um, the volatility of the bond, which in turn is given as the first order derivative with respect to X multiplied by this volatility function times lambda, where lambda is an unknown risk premium. But we know it exists. It has to be there. OK. All right. OK, OK. So OK, instead of doing this exercise of saying, you know, let's try and best fit it, let's just try and be, you know, do some more neural networks, OK? So we are now neural networkers, and uh, we want to, you know, try and identify this function. So we basically introduce a second neural net. We after we basically after. So we have this, you know, uh, auto encoder given here or decoder given here. So we have this function given already, and we wish to identify the function triple r mu comma sigma, which lives in one plus n plus the plus the triangle. You know, the, the number of parameters in the triangle of the of the volatility there. 
so that the PD7 we have is satisfied. <clears throat> so we solve this problem, basically attack this problem by representing nine, the function here, as another neural network. So this is a neural network that goes from, uh, let's say the two uh, state variables to, from two state variables to three plus, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, uh, three plus six, basically, dimension six. Um, so we construct a neural network that looks like this, stuff it in and, and try and fit it with the condition that we want the PDE to be satisfied. Um, here, I did a little bit, you know, I, I could train it directly on the L2 norm of this guy, but I actually weighed it by this guy. This is inspired by basically saying that this is an approximate shock ratio. I could have used the correct shock ratio, which is given here, but I was a little bit afraid of doing that because then you have something in the denominator that could potentially go bananas. So I just wanted to avoid that. So I used, you know, a proxy for it. Instead, I used a proxy for the uh, bond volatility, which is, you know, basically just the duration of the circuit bond. Okay. So we did that. And so now what we do is that we take the second neural network and we optimize the parameters on this second neural network until... And the neural network is constructed as an NP comma P neural network in the same spirit as what we had before. Um, all right, so what do we get? So these are the risk neutral, you know, in some sense, sharp ratios for the two factor case. So if we are completely no arbitrage at all for these uh, for these guys here, then for you know for the autoencoder, then all these lines should be just in zero, okay? But they're not in zero. They're not exactly in zero, but they're somewhere between plus 0.1 and minus 0.1. So they're low in sharp ratio sense, right? So if if you come to a hedge fund and say you want to put on a strategy that has a sharp ratio of 0.1, I'm not sure that you're going to get very far with that, right? Okay? So it's a it's a very you know small you know uh, sharp ratio, and across the board here, no and, and no matter where we actually look, it's sort of what the numbers we're getting. So about you know, five uh, percent RMS or thereabouts uh, for the sharp ratio. So low. So we conclude that the autoencoder is virtually internally arbitrage free. So there exist basically processes uh, an R uh, a triple R mu comma sigma, which supports these autoencoder uh, functions. You know, which is nice. So, so this, the result is a high dimensional function. Uh, you know, for the two-factor case, uh, six dimensional function, six dimensions uh, of a set of abstract encoding variables. So it's not easily presentable, but we can, you know, we can try and say a few things about it. The first thing to consider is whether the produced short rate actually extends the yield curve in a meaningful way. Does it look like the short rate that you produce is actually, um, you know, something sensible relative to the yield curve that we actually produce? And uh, that's what I do here, actually. So relative to the other curves that we saw before, this is, these, here, these curves here are augmented back to zero. So we have the short wave put in here in these points. And as you see, it actually sort of fits decently well, as in it seems like something that's possibly extending what we're seeing uh, produced by the neural network already. So sorry, I, hmm? I have a question. So you train the autoencoder on historical data. Yeah. Yield curves. So yeah. That's like what you call key. Yeah. And then in the second step, you you train a neural network to reproduce the second part, the decoder. Yeah. But that looks like you train it to learn the risk neutral dynamic. Yeah. So how, I mean, there's something missing. No. From, no. No. Where's the market? Where's it's magic. Yeah, what's the margin price of risk? I mean, you're you going to school too long. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's not here. Because the only thing we're actually doing here is that, you know, the, the market price of risk. So we actually, we note, note here that in terms of the P measure, in terms of P measure, the only thing we're actually saying is we're trying to fit a function, you know, one function to, you know, to observed observations, right? That's what we're doing. So we're not really looking at dynamics on the P at all, actually. We kind of, not really, right? We actually just seeing some panel data, cross-sectional data, and from the cross-sectional data, we're trying to back out what okay. these guys. Are. But it, but you're right, you know. 
not to the dynamics, but we're actually what we're producing is actually Q dynamics. That's the you know that's what comes out in the end. So it's a you know so it's it might you know take a little time. You might have a little think about this, but you know, we are operating on the P, but we're actually estimating on the Q. That seems a bit naughty, but you know it's doable. Um, all right, okay, because you know all these yield curves only really depend on dynamics on the Q. All right, so short waves look like they're connected to the rest of the curve. Uh, another thing you can look at is volatility of circle point rate, and you can compute it um, boom, 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 according to what I have up there, which is uh, basically the norm of n differentiated in respect to x time volatility divided by you know n tall something duration something, and then you basically get numbers for the different maturity circle point rates for different yield curve scenarios. And what you see here is sort of a couple of things. The implied volatility of the short rate, or sorry, of the yields are a sort of hump shape, you know, in, in general terms. They're not the t traditionally sort of decreasing uh, what you see, what you see normally see with short rate traditional short rate model is that you get something that's sort of always decreasing. Actually, you get something that's more like hump shape. And for the inverse curve, you get something that's where the short rate volatility goes up enormously. So very level dependent and very not, um, you know, uh, constant and simple. So interest rate, another one is like interest rate volatility is not completely off. I mean, it's not completely off the scale. It's sort of in the territory we could sort of recognize somewhere between, you know, in this graph here, somewhere between 50 basis points and 1%. Uh, so it's not like, you know, something completely uh, idiotic. Um, and we have this sort of like, you know, hump shape. Um, so not completely out of whack with casual empirical observations, also known as SOFA econometrics, uh, but you know, not scientific observations here, but you know, a bit more sort of uh, casual observations. So you can say, should I not do that? Well, you know, I had to write the column, I had to write the column in Wilma, I had to get it done. So I didn't really, you know, to get it all looked at in all its uh, extensions that it should do. Anyways, another one. A correlation between one year rate and the longer rate. So basically all starting in one and then looking at what do they look like as you go out in further maturity. And what you see here is again, you know, contrary to traditional short rate models, you actually see a negative, strong, strong negative relationship between the short rate, the very short rate, and the um, and the longer rates. Um, and actually quite remarkably, you know, in some cases, yeah. So which one is the red one? Yeah. So it's actually a high rate. So, you know, huh? Dollars? Yeah, but I think you, you know, sometimes see it as well. Like, you know, you see it empirically as well that, you know, short rate went up and then long rate actually went down because, you know, the Fed is fighting inflation and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I think it's not com completely inconceivable. All right. But of course, you know, this has to be. Uh, cross-checked a bit more. And we'll get to that in a second. Um, dum -dum -dum. This will go really through this. So correlation, again, seems to be highly level shape dependent. It's not constant. It's not something like, you know, uh, that we normally would assume correlations to be. Uh, strong negative correlation between short and long rates. In most cases, in many cases at least. Uh, it's plausible again, but it's you know like the volatility results. Uh, you know, you, you know maybe we should you know check it in more detail uh, against time series data, and for that sake, also implied option types of data. So okay, so so far we only discussed whether the auto encoder is internally consistent, but we have sort of touched upon do the parameters that come out here are they perfectly? Do they make sense or do they not? So basically. <clears throat> Boils down to whether they exist, you know, R mu sigma, uh, so that PD is satisfied for, for. So the internal consistency requires us to find this triple of R mu and sigma so that, you know, it's satisfied the PD for all x comma tall. But <clears throat> we also like to know whether the implied parameters actually match the realized historical parameters. 
And if this isn't the case, is there an arbitrary, external arbitrary similar to um, put it, you know, is there something you do with implied and, and realize volatility that would uh, enable you to, you know, make some money? So we suppose now that the actual evolution of X is given by something else. So we say that on the P, the risk uh, on the P, so the, the realized dynamics, the, um, the X guy here follows some other process, you know? So I've been lazy here, but normally think of it as a Markovian process. And then we look at a dynamically rebalanced portfolio with value V of at least, you know, N plus one circle from bonds that are chosen in such a way that it carries no risk with respect to X. So that differential with respect to X of the portfolio, so the delta, so the X sensitivity is zero, but it doesn't mean that the portfolio is zero, it is actually a real portfolio. So we neutralize the risk with using N plus one bonds at least. And then we look at what happens. So the value of the portfolio will then be evolving according to Ito's lemma, which we have here. But remember that, <clears throat> that Vx was chosen to be zero, so this drops out, this drops out. And then this guy here, we can substitute in from the PDE what that is. So now, basically, we take the, the realized volatility, which is the realized or the realized covariance here, this is the uh, implied covariance. That's actually what the carry would be in the, of this uh, particular position. This is the same sort of thing as you have for, what do they call it? The fundamental theorem of option trading, but this time for bonds. So basically implied volatility versus realized volatility or implied covariance versus realized covariance by trading linear instruments. So, so if, if this covariance matrix, two covariance matrices are not the same, or if the interest rate, which is implied by the, the, the short rate, which is implied by the autoencoder, if they're not the actual, if that's not the actual short-term interest rate or near it, then you know you can you will uh, carry a, you know you create a non-zero carry position for zero systematic risk. You of course, still you know the idiosyncratic risk that the autoencoder doesn't capture. We of course still you know be taking some of that. And this can be achieved, basically, you take interest rate volatility position basically by trading bonds. That's what it says. Um, modifications and extensions. So, so here's some, you know, some tricks and things that I should have done. Um, they're coming now. Um, I should have had better data. That was actually the biggest problem I had is that my data set is not exactly as good as I would like it to be. Uh, but anyways, so here's some, you know, you know think uh, other things that you might think about. So, so if you have an interest rate model of the one that we've been working with, which is like this type up here, so R is equal to R of X, some function of X, or X is a Markov diffusion process, then you can actually rotate it and normalize it and then you end up with a diffusion process which looks like this instead, which says unit diffusion. So now the number of parameters that you have in the system is actually reduced so that the number of, of parameters that you need to specify is now n plus one rather than this p thing, which was n plus one plus n, n times n plus one divided by two. So, so basically, if you rotate the model this way, sort of way, you can produce, uh, you know, the dimension of the parameters functions to only n plus one. And you have something with uh, encoded variables that have unit diffusion, okay? Which is sort of a bit back to, a bit, a bit back to um, what you would, um, the question about whether you actually try to regularize the X guys so that they have a specific dynamic or distribution. And that uh, you know, could be convenient in some cases because it's typically easier to say simulate something like this or you know, then that guy up there, or you know, for that sake, solve PDEs on it. <clears throat> All right. Um, so now the PDE reduces to uh, this guy here. And uh, it now suggests that you know, we should be able to uh, do it. Why not throw it all into one uh, decoder, basically? It produces not just the zero coupon rates, but it actually also produces R and, um, and uh, mu tilde. 
So it produces the whole triple, you know, so not only the circular rates, so the auto encoder produces not only the circular rates, but actually also produces in short-term interest rates and drift of this fictitious process here of the uh, auto encoded variables. And now the training target uh, could be something like the curve fit that we were using before. So we want the auto encoder to fit the, the curve. So the input to fit the output or the output to fit the input. But at the same time, we also want internal, we want to weigh that against internal arbitrage, which is given here, that the consistency of the neural network is, is good. And it's close to being, uh, you know, no arbitrage. And then but on the other hand, we also want that the diffusion, we say basically the diffusion that we observe, we want that actually to also match with um, uh, the <coughs> observed, uh, you know, observed dynamics of X. So if you, if you take the covariance matrix of, of X realized, we actually want that to be the same as, as, um, as the external, sorry, as, as what we assumed. Okay, so basically P and Q, we want them to be have the same diffusion. So on the P and on the Q, we want the diffusion to be the same. And in that way, we can now start looking at if we use different weights, W1 and W2, we get different results, you know, for the auto encode. And so, you know, you have a trade-off between curve fit, internal arbitrage, and external arbitrage. And you could also include in this story, you could try and include an, an estimation of the, of the, um, of the lambda guys, so the risk premium, because now you sort of introduced, you know, you're getting into dynamic territory. Let's see if you could say something about that. Um, so one thing I want to stress here is that this approach is actually not uh, limited to interest rates. We could use similar approaches for a lot of things, and that could include stuff like, let's say, commodity curves, potentially also foreign exchange, credit curves, um, volatility surfaces, for that sake could also go in here because they have the same type of, um, you know, you can put the same type of uh, upcharge conditions on that, but haven't tried it yet, you know, uh, to the extent that, you know, can say something reasonable about it. Okay, so let me round off with a conclusion here. Uh, two to three dimensional autoencoders can represent your curves with a surprisingly good fit. It's not new, it's not me who came up with that. Kondrachev and Sokol have already shown similar results. What is new here is that it has been shown that it's close to be internally arbitrage free and consistent, whatever comes out of these auto encoders. And we can identify the risk neutral parameters of the models that support the auto encoders. <coughs> uh, so, external inconsistency, so discrepancy between realized and implied encoding factor volatility, can be exploited by dynamic strategies in bond. Um, so the methodology as such applies actually to uh, several other, to most other asset classes as well, including commodity, um, credit, foreign exchange, equities, volatility as well. And the idea is actually not new. It's sort of 30, at least 30 years old. Um, when I was at Berkeley, we PhD students were having ideas of this nature or, you know, discussing ideas of this nature. But we didn't have auto encoders back then, so we didn't, it didn't occur to us that we should do it like that. Um, yeah, that's about it. Actually, and also, when we say that, there has already been uh, literature in this sort of direction, and I, initially I quoted, like, Björk and Christensen, but there has been other people who have looked at if you have functional forms for the yield curves, um, are they actually upcharge free? Is there actually, can you actually um, find processes that support them? Um, but explicit use of that to actually put formulate as trading strategies, I have not seen. Yeah, that's it. No more. Sorry, say, say again, say again, say again. Yes, 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 absolutely, yeah. I'm planning, actually, I have already gathered a really good data set from a, from a bank that you might know. <laughs> uh, uh, so that I was going to look at. Um, 
Uh, so, you know, I have, I have actually data going, stretching significantly uh, further back and that, you know, we would have to try and have, uh, have a look at it at some stage. I'd also like to actually include FX in this, somehow on the other, but FX as such is not really a stationary thing. It's not like really something that's bounded between something and the other in the same way as interest rates are. Um, but um, but maybe, maybe there, there must be a way around that. Uh, so I, I would you know, be quite interested in, in looking at that because this smells like there must be something like interest rate FX connection here there. That should be interesting. Yeah. Good question. Um, it doesn't seem to be anything particularly special about the autoencoder, right? It, it's a functional yeah. representation yeah. of using two or three factors. Yeah. But if you take some other, I don't know if you have, uh, you know, thought about it, but if you take some other, you know, two or three uh, exponential know, factors or whatever. Yeah. And, would it you throw your tests? Would you get similar results or would you get I don't know. Results? I haven't done it. Yeah, so. But. Uh... Okay, well, we have a PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> I have a similar question in the context of the sequence. Because you say exactly the same thing. Just yeah. Not the sequence, a finite form. Yeah. yeah. They don't exactly the same machinery, right? Yeah. Would you get something not very similar in terms of conclusions? I, I suspect that you probably could get something similar, but you probably need a slightly higher factor count. That's, you know, I strongly suspect that, but yeah. yeah. I'm trying to understand how you're assessing the second neural net. Yeah. Are you evaluating the sharp ratio only on your observed points? Or yes, or yes, yes, only on your observed points. So this means that your lack of arbitrage is not guaranteed out of sample. Uh, it's not, you know, by continuity, it's probably okay, you know, in, in the neighborhood of those points, right? But, you know, yeah, no. So if I were to use this for any form of forward simulation, I would expect it to have arbitrage. Yeah, you do have arbitrage. We've shown you how where they are, right? They're sort of... But of an order of magnitude more than what you said. Mm, I'm not sure you will. I'm not sure you will. Depends on, I mean, okay. Clearly, the autoencoder as such, right, is not really defined beyond what you actually have data for, right? The autoencoder itself doesn't really exist as such beyond what you actually, you know... It does. It's a function, yes. But you know, do you trust it? Be you know significantly further out than what you actually have the data for? I doubt it, though. You would have to, you know, as long as you stay within, you know, you would think that the autoencoder is sort of okayish, as long as you stay within what what it has seen. But if you take it beyond what you actually actually have trained it at, you know, I wouldn't trust it very much. Well, um, if, if you if you uh, well, you, you mentioned this uh, nonlinear PCA analogy. Mm -hmm. think of it as if you think of what you would do with the PCA, well, PCA would identify factors yeah. uh, in samples. Yeah. Now, the way to extend it beyond the sample would be to build a model for the for the PCA factors. For example, you can model the dynamics of your PCA factors factors with some simple process right. and then you can extend it beyond the sample by simulating forward the dynamics so here you could look at the dynamics of the outputs of the of the encoder I think yeah, that's yeah. What you the yeah, thing. yeah did you look at like what the outputs will look like in your sample mm, no but i in for example do they look like the level does the first one look like the level no, 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 I didn't even look actually because I, I didn't, you know, it's sort of uninteresting. It's like a, you know, it's a set of space they could sort of, I don't know actually. Maybe I should spend more time on that. But you know, um, that's a sort of a classical analysis you do for PCA. You try yeah, and for PCA, you, you, you try you try and back out to that. But again, you know, you can have the same. You can modify your neural network a little bit, and you actually get quite different factors, right? You know, I can scale them up and these factors, I can scale them up and down by. Yeah, I said there's no normalization. There's no normalization. In the case. second part, in second part I could, 
I, there it would be more relevant because it would be more comparable to what you actually would see in terms of dynamics, particularly if you have more time series data. But the normalization you did is unusual for PCA. You wouldn't do that for PCA. You normalize the, the, the covariance to yeah. unit covariance. Yeah, so I'm not sure how you would interpret the X's then, but uh, well, I mean it's just like some stochastic factors of sorts. They live on a you know, they live in a on a neural network, you know, so that's what they are, really. Uh, I don't know. I mean you can swap them around and they're still the same thing, right? Other questions? Second. My yeah. question relates to Norman's question about looking at these factors that is the low dimensional representation and the meaning behind it because it could happen even though it's different from the one neural network to the up to the other that you end up with levels to and curvature and similar representations as you would get in Nelson Siegel, for example. Of the how you would view the view, view the coefficients that could be but it's it's probably the case you can definitely you know it's probably not unlikely that you could take whatever an autoencoder and construct an autoencoder in such a way that you produce factors that look very much like a Nelson Siegel or look very much like the free first also in sorry PCA factors that you typically get out like you know level uh, flip flop and then you know this one you know that's probably doable yes sir uh, this is looking at basically encoding um, indi the individual curves and yeah. individual curves yeah. two or three yeah. factors yeah. you looked at basically encoding the entire market across all the well, that was what I was sort of alluding at, that it would be nice to do something in, 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 the, in the context of actually looking at encoding the whole system, so including FX. Uh, the selection of uh, currencies seems pretty expensive. So, uh, yeah, but here you're more saying sort of like, you're not, you're not, I'm not encoding how they actually move together, right? Because you would think that there's probably you would suspect, okay, you would probably suspect that if you have these 10 currencies, so the model actually says, the model kind of says that if you have these 10 currencies, then you need a 20 factor model to describe the 10 currencies, right? That's probably a lot. It's, uh, it's probably the case that you could, you could probably boil that down even further. But that's what you've done, right? You put them all together and explain them all with two factors. No, 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 single. two factors for each of them. Uh, yeah, the difference between Canadian curve and the dollar curve is basically where the two x's are. Yeah, because if you look at them separately, no, but, but the weights are the same, it's just the factors. Are... Yeah, the position of the factors is different. I mean, that sounds good. I mean, that sounds two dimensional. No, no, there's two dimensional for the curve, it's in itself is a fine result. But I, I, I conjecture you would get if you had sufficient data and you actually look at it, you probably see that there's more reduction in it than that. It's a single curve. It's just a curve. It's just model for one curve. You would think that they probably somehow move together in some fashion or another. I would think so. I wouldn't add a robo. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Which <laughs> bonds are using for you? So these are artificial. So these are artificially constructed zero coupon rates that that are such that they produce swap rates that match what I input with. It's not tradable. It's not what? It's not tradable. Uh, is it not tradable? Yeah. Well, in the euro, the euro swap is not a alternative on a bond, right? I mean, the bonds and the PPP. No, so, okay, so the swap rates are, you can say, Basically, what I produce is an artificial LIBOR curve, okay? It's a bit old school. It's a bit old fashioned. Um, there's, no, there's no difference between the discounting and the forward prediction in this particular case in order to simplify the system. So the basis is not really there, things of that nature. Um, another question to the basis, another question to the fact that um, if you're using uh, curves and currencies, you're implying that they're using. You could, in principle, do the analysis, this type of analysis on, on government curves as well, okay, if you, could, if you could produce them, right, if you had them, if you had that data. These are very convenient. This particular analysis 
is particularly convenient because you're doing things in swap space, okay? Swap rate space. Um, so you're saying, can you trade them? Or you can trade, I mean, can to some approximation trade LIBOR, right? You trade the library you used to at least. Because the additional question would be, would you actually be able to exploit the difference considering the liquidity that you find in the market so far? Would you be able to? I think that actually the interesting bit is not so much. Uh, so, okay, so the interesting bit is kind of mm, can you put on, you could, the, the question is kind of like, can you put on swap positions, let's say between 60 and 30 and 10 year or whatever, you know, in such a way that you exploit some sort of dynamics that uh, are favorable in your favor in the way that things move all the time? Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when you're talking about bonds, you just refer to the discount factor, right? Yeah, discount factor. So there's, there's no actual bond. No, no. It's just zero bond and discount factor. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, did you? Yeah, that's right. yeah, I have a question. Uh, so regarding the training for your uh, encoder, so yeah. you mentioned that you put like a uh, weight for different tender and different currency. Yeah. So would that make a difference? That so say some of them might have like much more volume say for like short for a tender for dollar yen or euro and yeah 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 i mean this uh you you do have in this data set i have i don't have as much i don't have complete overlapping data so some of these currencies do not are not present through the whole data set but the big ones are uh, so yes, correct. I mean, it's not um, it's not ideal. Um, yeah, you know, this is the data set. This also, yeah. Okay, last question. Yeah. Would you say this is a, a model that is spent? So those models where like you. Be able to trade all of the bonds to be able to get stochastic volatility. Or, or is it the key to a, a model with stochastic volatility that wouldn't be spent by the bonds? This is a spent model. Yeah. This is not, uh, there's no stochastic volatility in the unspent sense. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, sir.